Hello and welcome to the Transport of Nutrients lecture for Bio 120. Let's take a look at how microorganisms are going to transport nu nutrients across their plasma membrane. So this is a question concerning what does those little bacteria have in common? These are bacteria that are uh, giant microbes, they're little plush animals that are super cute. And if you look at them, they all have one thing in common. All these little guys are lacking mouth. So they do not have mouth or teeth, and therefore they cannot engulf, eat, or chew their food. So they have to devise other ways in which they can actually process the macromolecules that are going to eventually provide them with their nutrients. Now, so the topics of this lecture are going to be the role of cytoplasmic and outer membranes in nutrient uptake, how passive and facilitated diffusion works, and what is active transport. So some of you already have taken Bio 110 and you have covered this in particular detail, but what we're going to also be taking a moment is to look at how this specifically happens in prokaryotes, since you already are quite familiar with the eukaryotes. And if you ever want to get one of those adorable bacteria, you can always check www.giantmicrobes.com. I don't have uh, any kind of um, conflict of interest with that company. I just love the, the little products a lot. And actually, I have, a, I have one in my office that is now packed because, because I moved. But anyway, let's take a look at how microbes uptake their nutrients. Here is an image that is showing you uh, the general pathway that nutrients are going to take in macros, in microbes. Excuse me. So in the first part, you have a column about polymers. The second column is going to be the monomers and dimers derived from those polymers. What are they going to those be broken down subsequently? And later, where in the metabolic pathway those broken down molecules are going to fit in? So for example, let's take the issue of a protein. The protein is going to be broken into peptides. Those peptides are going to be further broken down into amino acids. Eventually, amino acids are going to enter as acetate or pyruvate, which can go into the Krebs cycle. Lipids, which are going to be broken down into fatty acids and cholesterol, eventually also become acetate as in the form of acetyl-CoA, which enters directly into the triacetic acid cycle. Nucleic acids are going to be broken down into purines and pyrimidines. Purines are going to be broken down into the sugar pentoses and uric acid. And again, everything gets broken down into acetate. Uh, the pyrimidines, dihydrouracil is the molecule that is going to be uh, broken down as well as the pentose. And that goes back into acetate. And the last point, polysaccharides, sugars. The sugars get broken down in pyruvate. Pyruvate goes to acetate eventually as acetyl-CoA. So by different kind of reactions, all the major macromolecules eventually can then enter the Krebs cycle as acetyl-CoA. And when the cell is processing those macromolecules, you're going to have the generation of sulfate, nitrogen, and phosphorus um, ions that could be then used by the cell. Eventually, as you know, when the energy harvest mechanism happens through respiration, for example, and the cell generates electron carriers that can go into the electron transport chain, you are going to have in respiration carbon dioxide and water and, of course, generation of energy in the form of ATP. But as you remember also, not every cell is going to be able to break this molecules and go through respiration. Some of them are going to ferment. So again, the acetate could be an intermediate molecule that is going to lead to further fermentation. So let's not think that this is the only pathway because the pathway illustrated here is just strictly respiration. Now, what are the problems that we need to consider whenever we want to bring molecules inside the cell? Number one is the issue of the relative concentrations. Molecules and ions are going to move spontaneously down their concentration gradient by diffusion. So the issue is, when they're moving through a cell, there's going to be a membrane, and the membrane is going to be a barrier that is going to prevent those molecules to move through diffusion inside the cell. Now, some molecules and ions could also move against their concentration gradient when they're actively transported, and you learn that in Bio 110. But as you remember from those lectures, active transport is going to require energy, and that energy can be provided by light or can be provided by ATP, or could be provided also by the gradient of one 
a solute that could be used to power the uptake of another molecule. As we mentioned, you have the issue of the lipid bilayer. The, the lipid bilayer is going to be that barrier that is going to now prevent the diffusion of those molecules into the cytoplasm. And the bilayer is impermeable to most of the molecules that the cell needs, especially the essential molecules and the ions. So, as you learn in Bio 110, the membrane is permeable to water, the membrane is permeable to gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide, and also it's, in, it's permeable to small uncharged molecules such as alcohol, so as long as they're polar. So there are some molecules that are going to be able to diffuse normally on their own through passive diffusion across the membrane, but not that many. The other molecules like ions and essential molecules which are charged or are very polar may pass through the membrane by diffusion, but it takes a very long time and the number of molecules passing is going to be incompatible with life. So when we think about the molecules that are naturally permeable, are going, those are going to diffuse freely in and out of the cell. Think about oxygen coming inside the cell. The cell uses it for respiration. If it's respiratory, out comes carbon dioxide as a product of respiration. So that there is no active transport. There is no mechanism to transport those molecules out of in and out of the cell. It just happens by free diffusion. Now, diffusion of water, as you know, through the plasma membrane is extremely important to maintain the cell physiology. And we name that osmosis. And it can be the uh, event that can change the life of a cell if the cell is not able to control or have ways to manage the way that water is freely diffusing inside of it. Because if too much diffuse inside of it, the cell can burst. If too much diffuse outside of the cell, the cell will dehydrate and die. So let's look at the functions of the cytoplasmic membrane as we know it. We talk about the fact that the membrane is going to be a permeability barrier. So it's going to prevent leakage of molecules out of the cell or prevent molecules from coming inside of the cell. We know already that it's going to have proteins anchored in it, and we know that it's going to be used in energy conservation by providing a membrane potential. So now that we think about that permeability barrier, what are the molecules who can what not diffuse inside the cell? So we know cations cannot move freely inside the cell. Potassium, sodium, calcium, magnesium, those cannot move in without help. Anions, chlorine, carbonate, phosphate, sulfate, no of those can move on their own. Small hydrophilic molecules like glucose, fructose, sucrose, all those molecules cannot diffuse across the membrane. And of course, large macromolecules, proteins, nucleic acids, fats, all of them are going to require to have some level of aid to diffuse across the membrane. So let's then look at how that solve that problem of diffusion has been solved. And the cell can have two different ways in which molecules can come in. One of them is going to be facilitated diffusion, and that is going to involve a protein to aid the diffusion of a molecule down its concentration gradient. The other mechanism is going to be active transport, and that is going to mediate the movement of molecules against their concentration gradient, and because they're moving against their concentration gradient, it's going to require energy. So when we think about diffusion, diffusion can happen in two different ways. There is passive diffusion that is going to be protein independent. So the solute moving down its um, concentration gradient on its own without the help of a protein channel, for example, to help them go through. So the rate of that kind of diffusion is very slow, and it depends on the concentration of that particular solute that is present. So if the solute is present at high concentration, passive diffusion happens faster. Now, as you know, passive diffusion is limited to small, uncharged, or hydrophobic molecules. Think about an alcohol molecule, think about oxygen. Those molecules are going to be able to, to diffuse across the membrane under on because of the gradient across the membrane. Now, the transport of a charge and a hydrophilic molecule occurs at a rate that is incompatible with the metabolic needs of the cell. So a charge or hydrophilic molecule can diffuse across the membrane by passive diffusion. The rate in which that occurs, it's not going to let the cell 
perform its metabolic functions and therefore live. So what happens then? We have protein facilitated diffusion. And what we're going to look is that that is going to require some kind of protein. In a gram-negative microbe, that is requiring two different kinds of protein system. And I ask you why, so I want you to remember the general anatomy and structure of the gram-negative microbe to answer this question. Why would a molecule require two different transport systems to get inside the cytoplasm of a gram-negative microbe? So we can look at that later in, this, in class for discussion. Some of the molecules that are going to facilitate uh, diffusion are going to be uniporters, and those are going to be located in the cytoplasmic membrane. In the outside membrane of the gram-negative microorganisms, as well as the mitochondria, you have porin molecules, and the porin molecules are um, large open channels that allow the passive diffusion of molecules in and out of the periplasmic region. So now, since Diffusion works in both directions. The molecule movement into the cell or out of the cell is going to depend on its gradient. So as the microbes have a molecule that gets into the cell, usually that molecule is immediately metabolized, so the concentration gradient inside the cell is always low, and therefore the gradient always points inwards towards the direction of this, uh, that molecule um, moving in. So the cell rarely ever stores proteins or molecules inside. For example, glucose, it's transported across and it immediately is using glycolysis and therefore the concentration of glucose inside a bacterial cell is always low. So the microbes will metabolize that molecule upon entry, so the influx of the molecule is always favored over the efflux of that molecule. So let's take a look at protein molecules that are going to help bring solutes inside a cell. So we're going to be looking at porins. Here is the image of the porin um, found in the outer membrane of the gram-negative cell. And here is an image that you can consider to be the uniport. A uniport, as you know, will allow the, the movement of a solute across the, mem the plasma membrane, the cytoplasmic membrane, down its concentration gradient. So porins are going to control the diffusion of small metabolites, so sugars, ions, amino acids. They're sufficiently, the pores are sufficiently large to allow any of those molecules to diffuse through them down their concentration gradient. The porin, however, is able to exclude very large molecules. So, for example, a fully folded protein cannot go through a porin. Now, in gram-negative bacteria, the inner membrane, it's the major permeability barrier. The outer membrane is not really a permeability barrier because, as we discussed, small molecules can come across. Only very large molecules cannot pass through. And that's why the outer membrane is not considered a permeability barrier, because the porins allow those small metabolites to be able to come through, which only molecules smaller than 1,500 deltons are able to pass through them. So the porin works as a specific or non-specific channel. So there are multiple different kind of porins, just not only one. Some of them are going to mediate entry of nutrients. Other ones are going to help mediate exit of waste molecules. They are large enough to allow the passive diffusion of molecules down the concentration gradient. And again, the rate and direction depends on the nutrient gradient. So they are going to allow small molecules to pass, but are going to exclude the very large molecules and enzymes. So large proteins, DNA molecules, uh, super large agglomeration of, uh, of fatty acids, they cannot pass through the porin. And as I mentioned, you have class-specific porins. So some of them are going to be non-specific, and some of them are going to be specific. The porins are present in the outer membrane of gram negative bacteria, but they're also present in the outer membrane of mitochondria as well as chloroplast. So it's believed to be part of the ancestral, uh, pr ancestral protein that helps the transport of solutes across the outer membrane of the organism. Now, here in this image um, from one review, it's the three-dimensional structure of a porin, both as a space field model and as a ribbon model. So this is a super-specific porin from Salmonella typhimurian, and as you can see, it's composed of three beta barrels that are um, arranged together as a triplet. 
you can we're looking now from the top of the bare barrel set and therefore we can see the opening where the sucrose is able to go through in the lower image we have the structure of the beta barrel and this is just a single monomer from the previous image and what you can appreciate is that the beta sheets of this beta barrel are moving anti-parallel so for example if you look at this one it's going up now you have a loop that then allows the other sheet of the beta barrel to move down etc then another loop that allows the sheet of the beta barrel to go up etc etc in the inside and sometimes in the cytoplasmic side and sometimes in the outer part you have small sections of the loops that are actually alpha helical shown here in red now as you know we mentioned the points are made of beta battles which are linked together by beta turns in the cytoplasmic membrane so the inside of the barrel is going to be hydrophilic and the outside of the beta battle is going to be hydrophobic so the beta sheets are laying down in an anti-parallel fashion and they form the cylinder that makes the point so we have a chain of 300 to 420 amino acid that folds to the anti-parallel beta sheets between 16 to 18 strands so depending on the type of foreign uh, there's variability between them um, you're going to have different strands made but the common point about all the porins is that they're going to form a bar beta barrel and that beta barrel it's going to be assembled in a triplet to allow this passive diffusion of a solute. So as we describe also, the amino acids that are hydrophilic are going to be in the inside of the barrel and the amino acids which are hydrophobic are going to be in the outside. And as you know from Bio 110, those polar amino acids are required because the pore is going to be interacting with the aqueous channel. So therefore water molecules are going to be present. What I want to show you now in the next slide, it's a model of the pouring showing you now the loops. So in this particular pouring, what I want you to show you are the loops connecting strand 5 and strand 6. In this particular pouring, it has importance because it is folded inside and that forms what is called the eyelet. The eyelet is the narrowest point in the pore and therefore that, that serves as a gateway that gives the pore its specificity. So depending on the kind of pouring, you may have different structures that are going to be formed and those different structures are going to help with the selectivity of the pouring channel. So what we conclude here is that the pouring molecules are going to be made of three bare barrels that are going to associate with one another to form a triple channel. Each of the channels is going to allow and selectively sieve out very large molecules. And as we discussed, some of those pourings are going to be substrate specific and other ones are going to be more general and non-specific. And last, all of them are always present in the outer membrane of the microorganism, the mitochondria or the chloroplast. So let's now switch gears a little bit and talk about protein facilitating diffusion. And what we have over here in this image, it's a channel that is opening to allow these little purple molecules to move inside. Those molecules are at a much higher concentration in the periplasmic region and much lower concentration in the cytoplasm. And therefore, when the protein opens up, that molecule is able to cross the membrane uh, specifically and move down its concentration gradient. So what do we see when we look at facilitated diffusion by uniporters? Uniporters are usually substrate specific. There's one uniporter, for example, for protons or for sodium or for any other molecule. So they're not going to be generalist. They're usually specific. They're going to allow solutes to move down their concentration gradient. And therefore, since they are using the concentration gradient, they're independent of cellular energy. Now, in prokaryotes are rare. One of them is going to be the glycerol transporter. And they're more common in eukaryotes, like the transport of glucose into erythrocyte. So the question is, why are there many more porins in eukaryotes and why are they rare in prokaryotes? I'm going to leave this question here for the flip lecture. Why are uniporters common in eukaryotes and why are they rare in prokaryotes? And that will be one of the questions that we'll discuss during our flip lecture.
So let's talk about the relationship between the uptake um, of a solute with the rate of solute entry and the concentration gradient. So this image from the book, it's showing you two different solutes, one that is going to pass the membrane to simple diffusion and one that is going to be transported inside the cell by a carrier protein. So what you see here is that when you look at the solute that is passing the membrane by simple diffusion, the rate of the solute entry here in the y-axis changes very slowly as the concentration of that solute increases. So in order for you to have some level of effective uh, increased concentration of that solute inside the cell, you must have a very high concentration of that solute in the outside. On the other hand, look at the green line that is showing the carrier-mediated transport of a solute. At very low concentrations, the rate of solute entry is very high until it reaches a plateau at a relatively low concentration. At a certain point now, that rate of solute entry um, plateaus, and therefore um, it doesn't go any faster, even as increased concentration of solute, which indicates the idea that at a certain point, that carrier-mediated transporter becomes saturated and cannot mechanically bring more solute inside the cell because its mechanism doesn't allow it. A question that I can leave here for you is what do you think will be able to increase the level of this plateau to make it faster? So keep that in mind. So to read what it's saying over here, the rate of passive diffusion is dependent on the size of the concentration gradient between the cell exterior and its interior. So a fairly large concentration gradient is required for adequate uptake of any solute through passive diffusion. Now, since the rate is facilitated, diffusion, as you see, increases with the concentration gradient more rapidly and at lower concentrations that, that it's seen with passive diffusion until that rate reaches that plateau, um, which is the point in which the carrier mediated transporter is now completely saturated because the carrier is binding and transporting the solutes as fast as it mechanically can and therefore that kind of transport is not going to happen any faster. To give you a summary statement, observe how the rate of simple diffusion increases with concentration of solute but it never reaches a concentration high enough to be compatible with the cell metabolic uh, activity versus the rate of solute entry increases dramatically at low concentration of solutes when you have a carrier mediator transported helping bring that solute inside. On the other hand, we're going to look at what happens when a molecule is moved against its concentration gradient. So that is called active transport. And this is another way of protein mediated transporters that are located at the membrane. So it requires energy because you're pushing the molecule against its concentration gradient. It's relatively fast and is independent on the nutrient gradient concentration, the outside. And usually it's unidirectional under physiological conditions. So therefore the molecule is going to move uh, against its concentration gradient. I say that because usually, say usually, depending on the concentration gradient, because we had seen, for example, that ATPase, which is able to use protons down their concentration gradient to generate ATP. But at the same token, you can now spend the energy of ATP to push those proteins outside. So depending, that will be then a bidirectional movement of an active transport molecule. And last but not least, those transporters are always substrate specific. Let's take a look at some of these types of transporters again. So some of these transporters that are uh, mediating active transport can come into different flavors. You have a simple transport shown over here at the top. And that simple transporter, it's going to use the concentration gradient of protons to be able to move a solute. So in this case, here is the concentration of protons being high in the outside, being uh, low in the inside, and as the proton 
it's moving down its concentration gradient, it can also then facilitate the transport of the transported substance here shown in red. The second one that we're going to look are going to be the group translocation systems. And those group translocation systems, what they're going to do is that they're going to use the energy provided as a, way, as a phosphate from phosphoenol pyruvate, or PEP, to mediate transport. So you're going to have the chemical modification of the transported substrate from phosphoenol pyruvate, and that phosphate, which is coming from a high phos di phosphodiester bond uh, from substrate level phosphorylation, gives now the energy of the to the transporter to move that solute in. And the last part that we want to look at are going to be the ABC transporters. And these transporters, depending on the type, are going to require ATP uh, hydrolysis for energy. So in this particular illustrated one here, you have one component that is going to be found exclusively in the periplasm that binds to the substrate and bring it to its specific ABC transporter. And when the transporter has the substrate, the ATP hydrolytic portion, which is in the cytoplasm, it's able now to uh, hydrolyze ATP and provide the energy to bring that solute, with, solute in. So let's take a look at some of these ion-driven transporters that are going to be talking about here. So we already discussed the uniporters, and the uniporters are going to let one solute go in by their concentration gradient. But let's take a look at these active transporters that are using the concentration gradient of a molecule to help another one move. So for example, we have an antipoder that is going to allow the transport of protons inside the cell, but also force uh, sodium ions out of the cell against their concentration gradient. So this transporter is going to use the proton motile force to now power the efflux of sodium ions. The other one over here is shown as a symporter, where you, for example, has um, lactose, and that is going to use, again, the proton gradient to bring the lactose sugar inside. And that is called a symporter because both molecules are going in the same direction. The other one is called an antiporter because one molecule is going in the cell and the other molecule is getting out of the cell. Some of these transporters are have multiple alpha helices from the protein. In this particular, usually they have about 12 of them. And those 12 alpha helices expand the entire membrane. And because of that, they're usually super specific about the solute that is being transported in. So for example, we're going to have a sulfate symporter, which the proton gradient is going to be used uh, to bring the sulfate ion inside. We're going to have a potassium uniporter that is going to allow the tr transport of potassium inside the cell. We're going to have a phosphate symporter that is going to again use the proton motile force to bring phosphate ions in. And here is the sodium proton antiporter where protons go in and sodium ions go out. And here it's the lac permease, which is a symporter allowing protons to come in at the same time that lactose is coming inside. So those are examples of uh, some of the molecules that are going to be mediating transport. Now let's take a look at the group translocators. And the one that we're going to be concentrating on are going to be the phosphotransferase systems, or PTS. The PTS systems are protein systems that have five different proteins. Through them, HPR and E1 are going to be common to all the PTS systems that transport many different substrates. Now, protein E2A, E2B, and E2C are going to be proteins that are specific for one substrate. For example, the E2A, B, and C from glucose cannot be used to bring maltose, but the HPR and E1 can bind to both glucose as well as maltose PTS systems. So the substrate is modified as it's going in, and usually the modification is going to be phosphorylation. That it's going to now, for example, in the case of glucose, immediately, com immediately convert glucose into glucose 6-phosphate when it is transported. And glucose 6-phosphate is now impermeable and cannot get out of the cell. Therefore, 
it provides a one-way concentration gradient of glucose, and because now glucose has been phosphorylated to glucose 6-phosphate, it is immediately brought inside glycolysis. The energy that is going to be used to bring that molecule in is come from phosphoenolpyruvate, PEP, and phosphoenolpyruvate, it is a um, molecule that is part of glycolysis, and we're going to take a look, that, uh, look at that in a moment. So for example, you have PTS systems in E. coli that can transport glucose, fructose, and mannose, and all those three have the common HPR and E1 subunits, but specific E2A, E2B, and E2C units. So this image from a Nature Review of Microbiology from 2008, it's showing you the typical type of the uh, phosphor relay that is going to happen during the PTS system. So PTS systems are distributed among many different kinds of prokaryotes and usually they transport carbohydrates inside like the glucose, lactose, fructose, mannitols, sucrose, and other sugars in E. coli. So let's begin by the point in which glycolysis provides phosphoenolpyruvate. This is the point, um, is one of the last steps in glycolysis and during normal glycolysis, phosphoenolpyruvate will donate its phosphate to ADP to generate an ATP and pyruvate. But in this case, the energy hardness in that phosphate bond in phosphoenolpyruvate will be given to the protein E1. So phosphoenolpyruvate will donate its phosphate to protein E1, generating a phosphorylated E1 intermediate and a pyruvate molecule that phosphorylated E1 intermediate is now able to pass that phosphate as a relay to HPR, generating a phosphorylated HPR and then recycling the E1 molecule that can now receive another phosphate from another phosphoenolpyruvate. At the end, the HPR protein that has been phosphorylated can pass its phosphate to the E2A subunit of the transporter. And by a different array system, the A subunit that is phosphorylated can pass that phosphate to the B unit and eventually to the C. And when, for example, glucose is transported across the C subunit, it can now get phosphorylated to produce glucose 6-phosphate. And that will then be used in the first step of glycolysis. What I uh, have here in the next slide is the actual text from the figure, and I'm going to leave that here for you to read and study on your own. But what I want to bring out of here are two points. One of them is the issue that phosphoenolpyruvate is derived from glycolysis, and the rate at which PTS, the PTS system works is dependent on having glycolysis working, and that is going to be illustrated in the next slide. So this next slide came from the journal of Microbi microbiology and molecular biology reviews, and it is showing the transport of a sugar across the PTS system um, and how that is related through glycolysis. So as you know, the carbohydrate transport and phosphorylation by the PTS system is going to be coupled to glycolysis. Why? Because during glycolysis, phosphoenolpyruvate, shown here in this box, it's going to be a substrate. It's going to be one of the intermediates. And as shown over here, during normal circumstances, it's able to generate ATP and pyruvate. But in this case, we're going to have it used differently. Phosphoenolpyruvate is going to donate its phosphate to the E1 molecule. The E1 molecule gets phosphorylated. It donates its phosphate to the HPR molecule, which is now phosphorylated. The HPR molecule uh, donated to the E2A. In this particular image, the E2A is not shown to be part of the membrane, but you know that it's, part, it's peripherally attached to the membrane, as I showed you in the previous slide. That's why I always want you to be critical about the images that you see, um, because they can oftentimes show different, um, can give you the idea that they're different. And at the end, going back to the discussion, E2A phosphorylated is able to give its phosphate to E2B and E2B to the sugar that is coming in. But now you have glucose 6-phosphate, if it were to be glucose, and glucose 6-phosphate jumps immediately 
into glycolysis to become fructose 6-phosphate, which eventually becomes fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, which gets converted to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, two of those molecules, then 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, 3-phosphoglycerate, and 2-phosphoglycerate, uh, which eventually becomes phosphoenolpyruvate again. So, the carbohydrates are transported and concomitantly phosphorylated by the PTS system. That phosphorylated carbohydrate fits into glycolysis if it is glucose or fructose phosphate, because fructose is also going to be now transported across the system and it just jumps into the step of the fructose phosphate step. And at the end, because you have the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate broken down into two glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, you end up with two phosphoenolpyruvates. Those two phosphoenolpyruvate molecules are usually formed by glycolysis, but one of them now is going to be used to give energy to the transport system, and the other one could come down to produce an ATP. So instead of having the two ATP molecules that you normally will generate through glycolysis at that step, you only have one. Or you may not have any because both phosphoenolpyruvate molecules could be used to transport the process, uh, to fuel the energy, to energize the transfer of glucose. So you have to be mindful of that particular point. So I will leave this image here for you, and I want you to now see how the process that you study in bio one of glycolysis is now coupled directly to the transport of the sugars in prokaryotes. As you know, and I discussed, this is a prokaryote-specific mechanism and does not happen in eukaryotes. So the phosphorylation of and the transport of that glucose across the membrane doesn't require the, the hexokinase that we have discussed in glycolysis for eukaryotes. Now let's take another look at other molecules. Let me see if I have maybe another thing over here. No, I think that's all the stuff that I wanted to say about this. So let's look at the other molecules used in transport, and that's going to be the transporters. So the ABC transporters, ABC stands for ATP binding cassette, meaning that they're going to use the energy of ATP to fuel the transport of a molecule. They're also primary transporters, and depending on the transporter, they will require between two to four types of proteins, and I'm going to show you that in a moment. They require energy, and that energy is provided by the hydrolysis of ATP. And they can be used to accumulate solutes against their concentration gradient, or they can also use um, to transfer molecules inside. So let's take a look at that in a second, because there are going to be two different kinds of transporters. Here are the two types of transporters. We can consider them two kinds because some of them are going to be exporters. And exporters are designed to bring molecules outside of the cells. And those are the terrible molecules that help cancer cells get rid of chemotherapy because they're able to use the hydrolysis of ATP to move a pro uh, molecule outside of the cell. As you can see in this image, that ABC exporter is composed of two chains, one chain in yellow and one chain in green. And those two chains together form a channel and the ATP hydrolytic portion, which is in the cytoplasmic region. Now, the importers can come in two different flavors. You have the nutrient uptake importers that are going to be able to bring sugars, ions, and amino acids. And you have the type 2 importers, which brings vitamin B12, heme, and siderophores. And we're going to learn about siderophores later. But uh, sufficient to say that therefore are chelating molecules that are able to bind iron very specifically and bring the iron molecule inside the cell. Now, the type 1 and type 2 transporters are going to rely on a substrate-specific binding protein that is found in the, in the periplasm of the bacteria. And once they bind to their substrate, they're able to bring that to their specific transporters, and once the ATP hydrolysis happens, that molecule gets moved across. This one also has four different chains. Two of the chains shown in blue and yellow are required to be the channel, and the other two chains shown here in 
Green and magenta are the ATP binding cassette. So you have the transporter itself having four proteins, and you have now the extra protein in the outside, which is the substrate specific binding protein. Now, let's take a look at how this works in the next slide. So here is uh, an image from the Review for Molecular Cell Biology from 2009 that is showing the mechanism that we believe works to help the ATP binding cassette transporter move a substrate in. So what you have is that in the open configuration, you have the transmembrane domain of the transporter sort of as shown over here in a V-shape, and that V-shape is open to the outside in the periplasmic region. When the substrate binding protein binds to a substrate and brings it down into the, um, the cell, now that is going to help hydrolyze the ATP found in the ABC portion of the transporter into ADP. And when that happens, that induces a conformational change that flips the conformation of the protein from the open periplasmic region to now being open in the cytoplasmic region. And that now facilitates the movement of the solute inside the cell. So um, many of the importers are going to have that binding protein component that is going to help them specifically find a solute. And as I mentioned, you're going to have two conformational states of the APC transporter, the outward facing and the inward facing, meaning that it's open to the outside or open to the inside. When the substrate binding sites, it's reoriented towards the periplasmic region and the cytoplasmic region respectively. So as shown here in the image, you can have an alternating opening and closing to allow now the transport of the molecule inside and the change in conformation, it's going to be requiring the hydrolysis of ATP. So let's take a look at two examples of ABC transporters found in a gram-positive and a gram-negative bacteria. So here in B, we have the E. coli vitamin B12 importer, and that molecule is called the BTU CDF. Now, this is a core transporter that has four subunits. It's going to have two transmembrane domain regions. That's going to be the purple and the red. Those are the BTCUC subunits. And it has two ABC transported units, and those are going to be the BTUD subunit, shown here in green and in blue. There's also a BTUF, which is the periplasmic uh, binding protein shown here in cyan in the outside part. So in order for this transporter to bring vitamin B12 to work, the binding protein will bind to vitamin B12, bring it to the transporter, and when that binding protein brings the solute to the transporter, ATP is hydrolyzed and therefore the transporter can now undergo a conformational change that is going to allow for the movement of vitamin B12 inside the cell. The other transporter that I want to talk to you is the one found in Staph aureus, which is called SAV1866, and that is a multi-drug exporter. So SAF1866 has only two subunits, the subunit uh, in green and the subunit in blue. And those two have a combined fused transmembrane domain region and the ABC domain. So the ABC domain is shown here at the bottom as these globular regions that bind to ATP. So whenever a drug, like an um, like a antibiotic, needs to be exported by this bacteria, it will bring it to the ABC transporter, ATP will be hydrolyzed, and that will then efflux that drug outside of the Staph aureus. aureus. This is one of the reasons why Staph aureus have become resistant to many drugs that we use, because they have the capacity to pump that drug out of the cell. So let's take a little moment to look at the periplasmic substrate binding proteins. As I mentioned, they are specific to one substrate and also specific with their cognate membrane transporter. So they are not a general family of proteins that can bind to any transporter. They only have one transporter that they bind. They're going to release their substrate to the transporter and then be able to bind to more substrates when they're free.
they usually have very high affinity for substrate between 0.1 and 1 micromolar KD. And they're always located in the periplasmic region of gram-negative bacteria. In the, the periplasmic region of gram-positive bacteria, they could actually diffuse out, and that's why they're tethered to the membrane, so they're able to diffuse laterally across the outer membrane of the gram-positive bacteria, but not diffuse away through the peptidoglycan layer. So how many transporters are present in E. coli? Well, we believe that you have about 150 different transporters in E. coli. E. coli has 4,200 genes in this, its genome, and of those, about 7%, 300, are devoted to transport. So nutrient uptake, elimination of waste products, and maintaining the correct levels of ions that are going to help it regulate its metabolism. And as I mentioned to you, many of these proteins are only made when needed. So the regulation of gene expression for those molecules, it's very tightly regulated and only made when there are in need, so only when the substrate is present. You have learned a little bit about that before when looking at the lactose operon, that only the proteins required to metabolize lactose are made when lactose is present. When glucose is the sugar used for um, energy, those proteins for the lactose operons are not made, and therefore the permeates, which is required to bring lactose in, is not made in the absence of lactose. That's one good example for you. Well, with that, I'll finish the lecture, and I'll post that up today and be able to see you on Thursday, hoping that you're having a good day and that you had a good exam. Bye-bye.